what's going on with the Boeing 777X? The original Boeing 777 flew for the first time about four years after its launch and started flying passengers only one year after that. But its replacement, the 777X, was planned to enter service seven years after its launch, but it now looks like it will take over 12 years to get it up and running with passengers aboard. So what gives? Stay tuned. In the 1980s, Boeing developed a version of its jumbo jet called the 747SP, or Special Performance. This model was basically a shortened version of its early 747 models, and the idea behind the SP was that airlines could use it for really long, non-stop routes with relatively few passengers, something that their regular 747s just didn't have the range for. The SP was, well, a interesting looking aircraft, but it wasn't a big seller, since it only really worked in this quite narrow niche. However, Boeing felt that there was something worth exploring in this concept, something that is today known as long and thin routes. But to make more of those types of routes available for even more customers, Boeing needed a more efficient jet. They briefly considered offering an updated version of the same shortened 747 body and calling it the 747 ASB based on the newer 747-400, but the airlines quickly told Boeing that they weren't interested in that at all. Instead, they wanted Boeing to do what Airbus had done with the A300. This was to make a wide body airliner with just two engines, making it big enough to serve the same role as the 747SP and efficient enough to work in a wide variety of different routes. That same jet would then also be able to compete well with the McDonnell Douglas DC-10 and the Lockheed TriStar, which would be great. And that is what led to the development and the creation of the original iconic Boeing 777. And the 777X, where did that one come from? Well, just as the original 777 family was meant to replace the 747SPs and many of the trijets, the 777X was built to replace the bigger, newer Boeing 747-400. But that wasn't the only reason for it. Boeing also had to respond to what Airbus were doing at the time, and that meant eventually trying to match the Airbus A350, which Airbus launched in 2006. And what made things really acute was when Airbus in 2011 upgraded their larger model, the Airbus A350-1000, to give it some extra range. That upgrade made that model more appealing to quite a lot of potential customers, which immediately got Boeing's attention. Because with those modifications, the A350-1000 actually had the potential to kill Boeing's 777-300ER, their biggest, most recent and most popular 777 variant. So, Boeing knew that they had to react. And stretching the existing 777, along with new engines and a new wing, seemed like the most logical thing to do. Now, on a side note here, I should point out that Airbus had originally also wanted to make the A350 by modifying the A330 in a similar way, by keeping its existing fuselage. But the airlines and lessers hated that idea, since it just wasn't modern enough. The A330 itself was a development of the A300, which dated all the way back to the 1970s, so a completely new aircraft was instead made, which turned into the gorgeous A350 that we see today. But in the case of the 777, well, that was a much newer design, and the airline still really liked its cabin and other features, so an update to this model actually did make a lot of sense. But there was a problem here, because that time period, around 2011 and 2012, was really busy for Boeing. The company had just announced the development of the 737 MAX, and at the same time, the 787 had just entered service and faced quite a few issues, including a couple of well-publicized lithium battery fires. On top of that, Boeing were also working on a newer version of the 787, the 10, meaning that they really had a lot of stuff going on already. They did try to pace themselves a bit, but they couldn't really afford to wait too long either, since Airbus aimed to introduce the A350-1000 in 2017. Boeing didn't want its next version of the 777 to enter service much later than that, so they initially targeted 2019 or 2020 for service entry. The 777X was formally launched in September 2013, sporting Lufthansa as the launch customer, and Boeing would be offering the airlines 
two different versions of this new jet to choose from. The larger 777-9 would take priority as the 747 replacement, so it was planned to enter service first, around 2020. And then the smaller 777-8 would compete against the Airbus A350-1000 and be introduced a little bit later. That Dash 8 was actually a little bit smaller than the 777-300ER, but Boeing also had to offer a newer alternative to the even smaller 777-200LR. So with that in mind, the 777-8 was designed to fit in between the two older 777s, which also meant that it would be pretty close to its main Airbus rival. In terms of design, well, like I said in the introduction, the 777X was supposed to be a quicker project than an all-new airliner, something that Boeing basically just could whip together pretty fast. It would first of all be equipped with more efficient engines and after getting offers from General Electric, Pratt & Whitney and Rolls-Royce, Boeing eventually selected General Electric and the GE9X. This was an absolute monster of a turbofan and it was created as an evolution of the GE90 which was already powering the 777-300ER. The engine includes elements from the 787's GENX with newer, lighter materials. And to give you an idea of just how massive this engine is, the cowling has a larger diameter than the fuselage of the 737 that I fly. But the other really big change from the 777 to the 777X was its wings. Here, Boeing borrowed heavily from the development of the 787 and designed a thinner, longer and much bendier composite wing with a higher aspect ratio. This higher aspect ratio also meant the development of perhaps the most famous feature of this plane, its folding wingtips. These folding parts are, by the way, much bigger than they look. Each one is actually 3.5 meters, or just over 11 feet long. And together with the engines, this really gives you an idea of just how enormous this plane actually is. Now, the purpose of those foldable wingtips is to allow the 777X to stay in the same gate category as the existing 777, since the gate category is decided based on wingspan. Not fitting this feature would have limited the airports that this plane could fly into due to taxiway restrictions and other things. And it would have also increased the cost for the airline since using larger gates would have also meant larger handling fees. Beyond that, the new aircraft would also borrow some systems from the 787, which was relatively straightforward since the 787 had previously also borrowed a lot of systems from the legacy 777. These similarities in systems and design meant that the 777 and the 787 already shared a type rating, allowing pilots to switch from one to the other with only a simple difference training. And that same process will now also cover the 777X. The wings and the engines were obviously key to this plane's success, but Boeing thought that the conservative fuselage design should make its development relatively straightforward, especially compared to you know, trying to start something from scratch. That's why in 2013, Boeing thought that they would be quite conservative when they projected that the first re-engine and re-winged 777X would fly in 2019 and then enter service in 2020. That would mean a seven-year estimate from program launch to service entry, which was actually two years more than the original clean sheet 777 had taken. But as it would later turn out, this wasn't nearly enough. So how could that be? And what does this mean for Boeing, Airbus and all the airlines who have already ordered the 777X? Well, I'll tell you all about that after this. Have you ever found yourself caught off guard by unexpected challenges, kind of like the way that Boeing did with the 777X? Well, sometimes life can be really unpredictable, throwing curveballs when we least expect them, and that's why having the right support structure and help is so important. This is why I am so happy to introduce the sponsor of today's episode, BetterHelp, a truly helpful tool which I've been using myself to try and become more productive. What I found really great was that I could access my therapist from the comfort of my own home, which saved me loads of time and just made the whole process feel more spontaneous and relaxed. Now, I personally use video calls, but you can also reach your therapist via phone or messaging. Signing up for the service is super easy. You just complete a questionnaire, send it in, and then you'll be matched with a licensed professional in as little as 48 hours. So if 
you feel like adding another tool to your mental health toolbox and maybe work on becoming a better and more balanced version of yourself, then use the link in the description here below, which is betterhelp.com slash mentor now. That will give you an awesome 10% discount on your first month with BetterHelp and you'll also be supporting the channel. Thank you, BetterHelp. Now let's continue the story. Now, as I said earlier, the airlines and lessers were already quite happy with the existing fuselage of the 777. And Boeing was obviously super happy that their existing jigs and other production infrastructure could remain in use as well for the coming production of the 777X. But just because it was almost the same, it didn't mean that there weren't any changes in the design and production of this new plane's fuselage. Firstly, even though the 777X is still basically an aluminium fuselage like most other airliners are, key part of the fuselage is actually made of a newer, lighter aluminium lithium alloy. Now changes like that can add to the development time of a design, but Boeing felt that it was definitely worth it since the use of these alloys would save a lot of weight. Other modern aircraft like the Airbus A380, the A350 and especially the A220 were already using this material in their designs. But probably the biggest change that Boeing planned around the construction of the fuselage involved robots. These form part of a system called the Fuselage Automated Upright Build or FAUB. So what was that about then? Well, basically, in normal cases, unless they're made of composites, aircraft are made by joining together metal parts with fasteners, which are usually rivets. Traditionally, this work was done manually, which kind of sucks, because each airliner may have millions of rivets, with the Boeing 747 famously needing about 3 million of them. Boeing's FAUB system would instead use robots to automate this extremely labor-intensive process, Boeing figured that automation like this should save both money and time, which in the end also is money. But unfortunately for Boeing, it turned out that the FAUB project didn't meet its lofty expectations. They started testing this system in 2015 and already from the very beginning, they experienced a lot of problems, which the workers, the system was created to replace, then had to fix by hand. These were initially considered teething issues, but late in 2019, Boeing announced that they were abandoning the FAUB concept completely. The time needed to fix these various errors simply caused a longer build time than it would have been if the work would have all been done by hand from the very beginning. Now, some automation was eventually introduced anyway for part of the work, but the machines just couldn't replace the humans, at least not this time. Fortunately though, Boeing had better luck with the automated assembly of the new composite wings of the 777X, but the wings production was still a bit of a challenge for them. Like I said, the design of the wing borrowed heavily from the design of the Boeing 787, but one key difference was that the 787 wing was made by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries in Japan. For the 777X, Boeing instead built a brand new composite wing facility in Everett to save having to ship wings halfway around the world, something that would have been really tricky for wings of that size anyway. That facility cost Boeing over $1 billion to construct, and as Scott Hamilton in Liam News pointed out, Boeing built it with plenty of spare capacity so that they would be able to use it for future aircraft projects as well. And that was likely because at that time, Boeing still planned to launch another smaller mid-market or mid-size airplane, which was known at the time as the NMA. Now, Boeing and their employees faced a significant learning curve as they got that wing factory up and running. There were even some early fears that the wing production could be a source of delays to the whole program, and that might well have been the case. But in the end, any such delays didn't matter much at all, and that's because of other, even bigger headaches happening at the same time involving the plane's monstrous GE9X engines. The first issues involved changes needed to make sure that the engines would meet the performance and efficiency expectations, which is something that isn't unusual at all for new engines. But then later, more serious delays occurred due to failing variable stator vanes inside of the engines. And these issues were found during flight testing under the wing of the General Electric 747 testbed. By the way, have you ever seen pictures from those test flights? 
that monster engine looked completely ridiculous, almost photoshopped under that 747's wing. It really shows just how big it is. It actually wouldn't even fit under the wing unless its pylon was tilted upwards. Anyway, later even more engine delays were announced after an unsatisfactory blade out test on the ground. And on top of that, at one point General Electric announced even more delays because of unscheduled maintenance to the 747 testbed's own engines. And as that wasn't enough, then came the incident where one GE9X engine was actually damaged in a hard landing as it was being shipped to Boeing inside of an Antonov 124. All of these engine and wing delays meant that by the autumn of 2019, the program was behind schedule by at least a year and it wasn't going to get any better. In September of 2019, the fuselage of a 777X ruptured during pressurization testing on the ground with a simulated high G load. This understandably got a lot of publicity, but it wasn't actually as devastating as it seemed on those videos. The failure happened at 148% of the limit load, meaning 48% more than the maximum load that the aircraft could legally experience in flight. The goal was 150% or one and a half times the limit load, which is a limit known as the ultimate load. That failure was actually so close to the target that Boeing didn't have to retest the design. They just had to explain how they would strengthen the design to fix the issue. And in any case, the engine problems that were happening at this time meant that the delays from the airframe basically had no real effect. But one thing that has an effect is you subscribing to the channel right now and liking the video. Anyway, that failed pressurization test meant that Boeing had to completely write off that airframe. But all of this trouble that I've just explained only delayed the 777X program by a little over a year. The first 777-9 performed its maiden flight in January of 2020, but by then it was clear that another factor would delay the aircraft introduction to service much longer. And this was obviously the two fatal 737 MAX crashes, which happened in late 2018 and early 2019. The added scrutiny which these crashes brought to both Boeing and especially the FAA meant that the way that the FAA was going to certify new aircraft from then on would have to change. One of those changes involved the fact that the FAA would need to do a lot more of the certification work directly themselves instead of delegating it to FAA authorized Boeing personnel as they had done before. And on top of that, the FAA and others were also looking closely at Boeing for any links between the certification programs of the 737 MAX and the 777X. Obviously, there was no cause from anyone to rush the certification process at this point, but the more direct work that the FAA had to do inside of the Boeing factories, the more both Boeing and the FAA had to rediscover how to work together, and that took some time. The implications of the MAX crisis also included some extra scrutiny from foreign aviation authorities, who now insisted on also getting directly involved with the certification process. This affected the 777X program just like it affected the MAX, and it brought on even more delays. The pandemic obviously didn't help things either, and Russia's escalation of the war in Ukraine introduced even more issues on top of the obvious impact from things like the supply chain. And that's because, weirdly enough, Boeing's 777X was partially designed in Moscow, since Boeing had launched a new design center there in 2013, before Russia's annexation of Crimea. Then, in 2022, Boeing shifted resources away from the 777X program to focus on certifying the remaining 737 MAX variants. And if that wasn't enough, more engine issues stopped flight testing again for around two months later in that same year. So basically, that was a lot of different issues. But what effects has this actually had on Boeing and the industry in general? Well, if we look at Boeing, one thing that we often forget is that the production of airliners today generally begins well before they enter service. Actually, the planes that we call prototypes or test planes are, aren't really prototypes in the normal sense at all. Like how Boeing's old 367-80 was the 707 prototype, for example. Today, and for quite some time now, the first test aircraft are usually built in the same production line where the rest of the planes will eventually be built. And many test aircraft will actually go on to fly for airline customers when the testing is done. 
That means that the Boeing production line for the 777X actually started in 2018, even before the Type's first flight. Now, obviously, it was a very slow production rate, but the line still started costing money for Boeing already back then. Remember, the initial plan was that the 777-9 would enter service just a year after the prototype's first flight, just like the first 777 had done. Now, obviously, that didn't happen, which means that Boeing is now spending a lot of money on a line that is not yet producing any revenue. Now, to be fair here, in this case, the production line of the legacy 777 is still running, making freighters, so it is quite likely that Boeing could shift a lot of personnel between the old and the new 777 programs, saving quite a bit of money doing it that way. But obviously, that older production line didn't include the production of certain parts that are unique to the 777X, like the wing, for example. And then there are, of course, the airlines, who are, well, let's say, less than impressed by all of this. With a delay this long, many of the airlines who had initially purchased the 777X were actually able to cancel their orders without penalty, or to switch their orders over to a different type, like the Boeing 787, with extremely good terms. But despite the delays and cancellations, Boeing today has over 450 orders for 777X variants, 205 of which are from Emirates alone. And they are not happy with this situation at all. Like I said earlier, Lufthansa was technically the launch customer for the 777X with an initial order of 34-9s, which they made in September back in 2013. But at the Dubai Air Show that same year, Emirates ordered 150 777Xs, with Qatar ordering another 50. Lufthansa later decided to defer the delivery of its jets, making Emirates the de facto launch customer. Now, they had made this huge order to cover their planned replacement of many of their legacy 777-300ERs, and the plan was for the replacement to begin already in 2020, when the new jet was supposed to be ready. So with all of these delays, Emirates was less than pleased when Boeing, on top of everything else, decided that they also needed to launch a freighter variant of the 777X, called the 7788 Fox. They did this because Airbus launched the A350 Fox, which was clearly aimed at providing an alternative to airlines operating the 777 and 747 freighters who needed to replace them. Now, this move made sense on paper, but it also stole some resources away from the passenger variants, which obviously Emirates and other customers were really waiting for. So this, plus giving priority to the certification of the 737 MAX, meant that the service entry date of the 777-9 has now slipped into 2025, and as for the Dash 8, well, it hasn't even flown yet. I fully understand Emirates' frustration here, because this situation leaves them with very few choices, especially since, like I mentioned in the previous video, the Airbus A350-1000, which would have been a possible alternative, has its own problems, which stopped Emirates from ordering more of those. With long-haul travel now fully recovered in many parts of the world, other airlines are keen to get their 777Xs too, so there is some real demand for this aircraft, which I completely understand. Because if Boeing and General Electric deliver on their promises, the 777-9 will have 20-21% to better per seat economics than the 777-300ER has. 10% of those comes from the engines, 7% from that super long wing, and the rest from the size and weight related improvements. Finally, it's worth pointing out just how troublesome this trend of longer and longer aircraft development times are. It is obviously extremely costly for the aircraft manufacturers, since they don't start getting a return on their investments until, well, 12 years later in this case, so these delays are making new programs far riskier to even start. On top of that, the airline industry is a cyclical business, and 12 years after a program is launched, the needs of the market could be completely different than what they were designed for when the aircraft was actually made. Because of this, both Airbus and Boeing are looking for ways to bring these development times down, to stay more nimble. And that, their ability to do that, will likely be the next arena these giants will fight on. Now, join me on Patreon to discuss this in my next Zoom hangout. Or get yourself an awesome t-shirt and make sure to download my free mentor app to get your latest aviation news. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.